Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the TCLF one-on-one series. Through the one-on-one series, we aim to interact with the best legal professionals from India and around the world. Today, we speak about a theme, a subject matter of law, which is very close to my heart personally. And this is a subject I am in love with, competition law, or as you may call it, antitrust law. And we couldn't be more honored to have a guest of the stature of Mr. Rahul Rai to join us as a guest for this episode. Uh, Mr. Rahul Rai is an off counsel at AZBN Partners, helping and assisting the firm in their competition law matters. He is also associated to the chambers of eminent senior counsel, Mr. Gopal Subramanyam. Uh, sir has been recognized as a leading practitioner in the field of competition law by a number of reputed ranking journals and guides, including the very famous Who's Who Legal. Uh, having graduated from NUGS Kolkata in 2007, he went on to pursue his master's degree from Stanford University in the USA in 2011, having gained a substantial amount of work experience, as is evident from the time gap between the two degrees. Uh, sir, it's an absolute honor to host you. Thank you. Thanks, Atan. I'm happy to be here and happy to speak with you all. So, just to set the tone for the conversation, uh, when when you joined the professional, uh, competition law wasn't as popular a field as it is now. We see law students as well as young professionals, you know, trying to venture into this field uh, in, in, in the recent days. So, what was your first encounter with the subject as a professional and what, you know, motivated you or inspired you to pursue a career and build a career out of this? No, I started law school in 2002 and the Competition Act was passed by the Parliament in 2002. So in the first year of my law school, uh, this Act was uh, passed by the Parliament and uh, I read about it in newspapers and uh, the law school that I went to, National University of Juridical Sciences, uh, was headed by back then uh, Professor Madhav Menon. Uh, he was a dream seller and he had this knack of identifying areas of law uh, which were new, which were not the traditional areas of law and try and introduce courses in that area at NUJS and he had experimented with this when he uh, headed the National Law School in Bangalore. Uh, so on the very first day, in fact, when we uh, were sitting in the orientation, Mr. Menon uh, talked about multiple new areas of law and his plans okay. to introduce courses in those areas. And two areas uh, uh, immediately piqued my interest. One was antitrust and second one was international trade law. Uh, part of that being that I uh, quite liked economics in my oh. high school and had studied economics uh, in grade 11 and 12. Uh, had harbored this uh, fancy dream of doing econ honors from Delhi University. Uh, didn't make the cutoff. Uh, ended up as a lawyer, uh, but uh, a new area of law with economics as its uh, foundational principle uh, right. got me interested. And when this course was ultimately offered to students at NUJS, uh, right. I took it up. Uh, and uh, I also continued to, while uh, studying at NUJS, in each one of my internships, uh, I uh, put myself out there in the law firms and in the teams which were uh, doing international trade law and had an inkling that there is a new law on the horizon. And uh, that's uh, going to kind of tie into the trade law practice. It doesn't tie into it. I mean, after 10 and, 10 and a half, uh, you know, about 12, 13 years of practice, I realized that some bit of theoretical overlap might be there, but otherwise the practices are quite distinct. Right. Uh, but that's how it all started. It's Professor Menon that I credit uh, for having shown many of us the dreams uh, to try and pursue careers in areas which uh, probably no one in the country had heard of. And uh, today from the graduating batch of 2007, I know of only three people who practice antitrust in this country of 1.2 billion people. 
uh, what then is an ex colleague from AZB. She's uh, part of the national, not national, the Nestle antitrust group okay. in Switzerland. Uh, one of her yeah. colleagues is at uh, SNR uh, heading their practice out of Bangalore. And I'm with her one. So it's a, uh, all of that probably is uh, the credit has to go back to Professor Menon for having inspired us to take up this course. That's that's an inspirational thing to hear, sir. The, how how students are motivated by a good teacher, and you know that's that's something very inspiring to hear. And if I'm not wrong, you were one of the foundation. You 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 were one of the foundational practitioners of the competition law practice at ELP. If I'm not wrong, uh, so uh, that that's something very good to hear. Part of the team which uh, which set up the competition practice at ELP. So uh, yeah, here who was my a senior colleague back then, Samir Gandhi, and who right. continues to head the antitrust practice at AZB. Uh, the two right. of us took the initiative to uh, set up the antitrust practice at ELP, and then subsequently we set it up at AZB and Partners uh, in oh. 2000. Right. Uh, so, see, uh, apart from being associated to AZB as an off council, you are also associated to the chambers of senior council Gopal Subramanian. So how do you balance the two, given the difference in the kind of work you do for these organizations? Let me answer that by, by going back to my motivation for uh, transitioning from the partnership role at AZB to an off-council role and also joining Mr. Subramanian's chambers. Right. Uh, I had practiced for close to 12 years uh, by 2019 is when I transitioned to this off council role and I started working with Mr. Subramaniam and I hadn't done litigation, courtroom litigation. Okay. I had never done. I had been to the Supreme Court for one matter back in 2009, not 2009, right. 2010, when the Competition Act okay. uh, got promulgated, uh, right. the appeal which went to the Supreme Court of India and on behalf of CCI, I had the opportunity to brief Mr. Subramaniam. So, okay. Uh, after having done the law firm route uh, and enjoyed it, I quite enjoyed it. The, the opportunities and the learnings within the two law firms that I worked at were tremendous. Uh, but after 10 odd years of law firm life, I realized that uh, as a lawyer, I also needed to have greater comfort with the courtroom. Right. Uh, and uh, when that opportunity to work with Mr. Subramanian arose, uh, I just couldn't say no to it. It was it would have been foolish on my part to let go of that opportunity. And uh, thankfully, AZB created that platform wherein I could continue to work with them as an off council. And Mr. Subramaniam gave me the flexibility that you do what you can do uh, with AZB and you help uh, with the chamber work and and the, with the litigation briefs at the chamber. So it fits pretty well into my own. Uh, desire to become a better lawyer. Right. Uh, there is a side of antitrust practice which is litigation. Uh, and once yeah. things move out of the commission, uh, they go to appellate tribunal or they might go to the writ courts. And finally, everything right. moves to the Supreme Court. Right. Uh, so no matter what the economic underpinnings of antitrust law be, uh, right. at the end of the day, it is law. At the end of the day, it will get litigated. And that is something that I hadn't seen for 10 odd years, apart from uh, doing a couple of uh, right. matters as a junior in the Supreme Court, briefing senior counsels. Uh, so the idea was to try and get better as an antitrust lawyer by getting better right. as a lawyer in general. Uh, so it's right. worked out that, I mean, given that motivation, I've spent a year and a half uh, with Mr. Subramanian. Uh, right. Of that year and a half, half a year has been uh, kind of lost because uh, courts have not been functioning to the full strength. Uh, right. So far as litigation, active courtroom litigation is concerned. But that has given me again the opportunity to balance the two works pretty well, two work streams pretty well. The, the courtroom workload has not been that significant in the last six months. Uh, the antitrust work has been as busy as it has been for the last 10 years. So there hasn't been any dip in that. Uh, okay. I'm able to balance because I don't do routine uh, antitrust assignments from AZB. I get involved with them on select matters. 
and therefore the quantum of work is no longer what it used to be on my plate uh, when i was a full time serving partner with them that's that's a fascinating thing to hear so it's basically what what i can gather from it is that you basically made this switch uh, to upgrade yourself as an antitrust lawyer because you have been there in the filing part and everything now you wanted to you know be involved in the action the litigating part litigate the law in order to get better so that that's not, a, that's not, a fascinating not, I, would, I wouldn't i wouldn't phrase it that way right i mean okay. there's a very important part of work that you do as a lawyer while you work right. with a law and you litigate it's not that you don't right. litigate uh, right. what you don't get to see is the perspective of an arguing counsel while you right. are uh, within a law firm setup unless that law firm itself has uh, advocates who go out and argue right. before the court so it is okay. to gain that perspective uh, right. otherwise you know the word filing practice is actually the, the most important part of or it's actually right. as important as litigating before the courts is because right. you are creating the groundwork for ultimate advocacy before the judges Right. so both of them are equally important uh, right. i felt that i needed to see the other side of the action up close uh, right. that is something that i hadn't seen because uh, i hadn't even interned with a senior counsel during my law school days right. i was pretty focused on uh, doing anti trust and international trade work and therefore uh, i kind of exhausted most of my meaningful internships with firms right. with says in international trade and anti trust so it was right. to just learn the other side of the perspective and you need that perspective to be a complete lawyer i just felt that i was inadequate as a lawyer uh, right. without having the courtroom advocacy side of the practice right uh, great got it sir uh, so you, as as mentioned earlier you pursued a masters degree in law from uh, the stanford university which is undoubtedly one of the most innovative law schools and best law schools around the world so did your lectures at stanford help you in your practice in india as far as litigating part is concerned look again lawyering has two aspects right one right. is how you conduct yourself before the courts or before the regulators and the second one is the understanding of the law Right. Uh, Stanford has uh, courses which, uh, and of course, it has hundreds of courses that you can choose from. And I think it's not right. just Stanford, but uh, many of the leading law schools in in the United States have right. uh, both courses which uh, focus on the theoretical aspects of law, as well right. as uh, they are taught in a manner. that you also understand the application of law and not just the underlying uh, basic principles or underlying jurisprudence so that helps that helps in uh, going back to uh, the starting point on anti trust uh, has right. helped me a lot uh, right. the courtroom advocacy part i did not uh, take up clinic courses that's where you get exposed to in an academic institution the courtroom advocacy aspect of lawyering uh, right. i did not take any of those clinical courses my focus was on uh, studying uh, with as many anti trust and international trade professors as i could and i right. did that uh, and what it i the benefit to me has been in terms of knowing where the law comes from what right. is that the line principle uh, which is reflected right. in the statute books uh, right. interpreting the statute in in the manner that appears most intuitive most obvious may not always lead to the right interpretation and therefore right. i think that uh, each one of us as lawyers uh, whenever that we either have the time or the interest Uh, right. we should go back and read the basic principles devoid right. of the decisions we need to go back to, to that starting point and understand where a law comes from uh, to be able to interpret where a law should take you to right 
And I think this becomes particularly important in the field of antitrust law, wherein jurisdictions such as the United States and the European Union have had established jurisprudence and have been dealing with these cases from a very long time, much before India, I should say, uh, in terms of the diversity of the cases that they have had. Uh, so that may have helped you as well at Stanford, knowing the, the right amount of knowledge and the diversity of opinion, basically. Uh, so, so more than it's the understanding of the basic principles, which in right. antitrust are global. Their right. application may vary. Their the outcomes from the application of these principles may vary across countries because the economic right. conditions in different countries, the, right. the comp state of competition in the markets in different countries is different, uh, right. and therefore. Uh, again, the universal perspective is a perspective on understanding the basics of the law, which you end right. up applying in India. Uh, right. Is that true for other areas of law? And I think that it's true for constitutional law as much as it is right. true for competition law. So I wouldn't uh, isolate competition law as a very unique area of law where uh, the global perspective is something which is valued more than the global perspective in other areas right. of law. You see the uh, Supreme Court discourse in the right to privacy case, the Peter Swami case. Right. Uh, uh, the arguments were led by Mr. Subramanian uh, right. in that case, and many other leading lawyers had very important role to play in that case. And a lot of them had brought in uh, the debates from uh, countries like the United States, the European right. Union. Uh, the continental part of the Europe, the common law part of the Europe, uh, and therefore, uh, in today's world, in any in any area of law, uh, knowing what's happening elsewhere uh, would sharpen you as a lawyer in India. So antitrust is no no different from other areas of law. I think that all areas of law benefit from uh, the global perspective. That's an interesting take, sir. Uh, just talking about the obvious, uh, like uh, every law today is being asked questions, uh, has is facing new issues uh, as due to the outbreak of this uh, unfortunate pandemic. Uh, so, what can you highlight some of the competition policy responses to the pandemic? How have the regulators responded? You see, the Indian antitrust regulator has become a little more generous okay. uh, so it does it, in the last six months at least in two cartel decisions okay. and and remember that cartels are the worst forms of anti-competitive practices okay. uh, uh, in two cartel decisions the cci has uh, decided to not levy penalties uh, okay. part of that motivation or the motivation for such a decision could be that these companies are anyway bleeding and if I impose penalties to the extent that the statute allows me, uh, then we might as well kill these industries. So that's been a uh, that's been a very practical decision from the commission, given the state of the economy that we are in at the moment. Right. Uh, the CCI also issued guidelines on how to. Uh, and these were not very detailed guidelines, yet they were helpful in sending out this right. signal to the industry. Uh, but these guidelines were on how to collaborate uh, to try and meet the challenge of this pandemic. So, for example, if a, a Zomato and a Swiggy were to, which are competitors in their own world, uh, right. but if Zomato and Swiggy were to uh, collaborate by harnessing uh, the efficiencies uh, that could arise because uh, they are sharing the cloud kitchen spaces. Uh, in an ideal world, such a collaboration would be suspect in the competition uh, uh, law. Uh, but to, if this collaboration was to happen to meet the challenge of the pandemic, uh, the commission would look at it uh, a lot more generously. Uh, uh, it has indicated so. So these were two pretty. Uh, these are two key highlights that I picked from 
the Indian regulator. Okay. The other regulators outside India have also, on the collaboration aspect, uh, either expressly or implicitly indicated that if you collaborate, then we will not necessarily go on a witch hunt and start investigating you for collusion. Uh, obviously, they will do that if they see that the collaboration was a facade for collusion. But a genuine collaboration will not uh, be, uh, be opened up uh, right. for a possible cartel inquiry. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I get that point. Uh, it's basically that as long as you're uh, collaborating for efficiency gains and benefiting the consumers, that's fine. But if you're just being a facade of collaboration and, you know, in the garb of collaboration, what you're doing is basically anti-competitive, then obviously the regulator will step in. So, so uh, yeah, and talking about some of the other recent issues, uh, ever since the publication of the market study report by the CCI on e-commerce, we have seen a lot of debate and discussion happening over antitrust issues in the e-commerce sector and how how these e-commerce players work and everything. In fact, uh, some of them are facing antitrust investigations from CCI as well. Uh, so, like, what what are these concerns and where do they come from, basically? Look, we must acknowledge that e-commerce has disrupted the status quo, which was going on for uh, centuries. Uh, the concept of a corner uh, Kirana store has been there in India for ages. Uh, in my own view, these corner Kirana stores were mini monopolies. Uh, because you will see you walk out of your home and if there is a Kirana store next to your home, quite likely that it's the only one around there. And therefore, when you step out to buy something from them, unless he knows you or she knows you, uh, they will not be generous in reducing the price further below from the maximum retail price in India. Right. So there was a significant margin play with these local brick and mortar Kirana stores. Now, obviously, they are part of our social fabric. So right. uh, a lot of us as consumers, if we see these Kirana, Kirana stores going out of uh, business will feel a little bad. Uh, right. But these local micro monopolies have been challenged by the e-commerce and have been broken up by the e-commerce. Now, right. there are hundreds and thousands of these local micro monopolies. Uh, obviously, right. they are feeling the pinch of uh, a large disruption which has happened and it's not a, a decadal disruption. It's a it's a disruption which has changed things for, which were assumed to be the regular course norm for hundreds of years. So it is, uh, you know, we are in the process of that churn and the churning process will lead to some pain points. Uh, some people will be happy. Some people will not be happy. Uh, okay. So I'm not sweeping aside the potential antitrust concerns. But I'm, uh, what we need to understand is that a lot of noise that we hear against the yeah. e-commerce companies comes from a challenge to centuries old system of uh, micro monopolies who we were very accustomed to dealing with. Uh, if, a, if a matchbox is sold to you at one rupee a piece because one rupee is printed on it as a maximum retail price. Uh, right. As a customer, we don't even question it. But it could right. well be that you could get a 10 PASA discount on it if you were to try and negotiate it with the local Kirana store. But they don't leave you with any avenue for that discussion or negotiation. And that is being challenged. So it's a good thing. Overall, right. I think it's a good thing. Now the question is that in this process, how do we ensure that uh, they are not being booted out by adoption of unfair means or anti-competitive right. means? And that's right. where there might be some merit in the concerns. Uh, right. Are those concerns valid with respect to company A or company B or company C? I will not comment right. on that. Yeah. Uh, but one of the concerns which has been most prominent uh, and which I think is pretty much misplaced 
is a concern of predatory pricing. Right. That concern is misplaced because in India, uh, the e-commerce companies, the foreign e-commerce companies particularly, uh, are only marketplaces. They aren't uh, online retailers, so to say. And therefore, when you try and buy a product from Amazon, uh, the price is set by the seller who uses Amazon's platform as a marketplace. Let's go back to uh, the potential antitrust concerns, uh, which are being talked about in the context of e-commerce. Uh, one of them is predatory pricing, uh, which appears to be the, the leading concern uh, voiced against e-commerce operators. Uh, that in most cases appears to be a misplaced concern. Because in India, uh, most e-commerce operators operate as marketplaces. And while they may have some role to play in the price at which uh, the sellers using their platforms the product to end customers like me and you, uh, the price is ultimately determined by these sellers using an e-commerce platform as the marketplace. Uh, predatory pricing in statute books as a very important uh, and necessary constituent element. And I'm leaving aside this whole argument on whether the prices are low or not, whether they are low uh, or whether they are so low that they go below average variable cost or any other benchmark of cost. Let's park that aside. Uh, there is an equally important necessary constituent uh, uh, of predatory pricing, which is the intent to kill competition. Right. And this is one aspect of antitrust law where uh, there must be an intent, a proven intent. And that proven intent must come from uh, documentary evidence or any other circumstantial evidence. And in economics, if Micromax, for example, as a matter of uh, principle, decides to sell all its handsets uh, through the online channel uh, at prices which are 30% less than uh, a handset which is being sold by another smartphone manufacturer, is that predatory? Is, is Micromax trying to kill that other competitor in the market? Uh, answer is no. Uh, and therefore, uh, when people throw predatory pricing allegation on e-commerce uh, platforms, uh, they need to again go back to the basic principles, understand what predatory pricing is, what the constituent elements are, and then build those arguments up. Uh, there are other concerns which are being talked about. Uh, in the context of larger e-commerce operators, which is that uh, they also have the potential to engage in uh, self-preferencing. Uh, while in India, they can't necessarily, or they, they don't necessarily have the ability to sell their own products because they only operate as a marketplace. Uh, they are giving preference to the products of their preferred sellers as opposed to smaller sellers. Uh, uh, is that a kind of discriminatory practice? Uh, appears to be on the face of it, a fair concern. It must be examined by the regulator. Uh, in examining this, uh, should there be a per se approach or should you really look at the end economic impact on the competitive conditions in the market as a whole? Uh, there has been some debate there in the context of e-commerce, particularly ever since uh, Lena Khan wrote that paper, Amazon's and right. Trust Factor. And that that paper is a is a lovely read, but it's 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 uh, it raises some valid points. But in the context of the United States, uh, right. it raises some valid points in the context of the United States, and it talks about whether the U.S. approach to antitrust enforcement must change because the courts have held in a certain way. Does that apply to India? 
immediately? My sense is no. Because the Indian law is worded a little differently and therefore we have enough flexibility in our existing rules to examine the, the self-preferencing concern, for example, that I talked about. To examine even a predatory pricing concern. Uh, so these two appear to be the, the forerunners in the uh, potential concerns. And then obviously when someone files a case, they try, they try and, and throw everything on the wall and see what sticks. Uh, but there's a lot of noise around the potentially anti-competitive actions of e-commerce enterprises. Uh, uh, if we remove the noise, then there might be some concerns which merit investigation. I think this this was a much needed conversation and a much needed answer because uh, personally also I believe that uh, you know uh, you read many blogs uh, at, at like any given day you open up a blog on competition commercial laws or any or any journal there are a lot of articles a lot of papers about these concerns and how they're valid and everything but this is a very very different perspective and a very I should say a very novel perspective to the issue that we must look at the broader picture and be open to the idea of these concerns not being valid at some point. So I think this was a much needed conversation. Uh, talking about uh, another issue, uh, just to briefly touch upon it, there have been also some jurisdictional challenges to the CCI in the recent past. For example, the recent Monsanto case, wherein uh, the Delhi High Court basically upheld the jurisdiction of CCI to deal with patent licensing matters if they directly pertain to some antitrust concerns. So like, why, why do we see that frequent, frequently these uh, regulators fight with each other regarding jurisdiction? Where, where does the overlap come? Look, I have very strong views on this, which I have held for quite some time. Uh, and we are, uh, I'm involved in a couple of cases where we are arguing that point. In the, Obviously, the CCI is the the uh, must be the arbiter of antitrust or competition related issues. But when the initiation of an antitrust concern, or when the origin of an antitrust concern rests upon a foundational question, for example, in the context of uh, Monsanto's case, which is that is there a valid intellectual property right which is being used or allegedly abused to charge very high trade fees. Right. So charge of very high trade fees is the antitrust allegation that these high fees are unfair. Right. But this allegation stems from the foundational question of whether Monsanto has a valid intellectual property right. Right. Now, the validity of that intellectual property right is something that the CCI cannot determine. Yes. And till the time that validity is determined one way or the other, the subsequent antitrust allegation cannot be examined. Right. The Delhi High Court, not just in the case of Monsanto, but also in an earlier round of litigation involving Ericsson and Micromax. Right. Uh, has uh, held and very categorically held that uh, the commission has jurisdiction. But I think that the questions, the question of law was not framed uh, in the right manner in these litigations. Uh, uh, the question of law is this central point that when an antitrust claim arises from a certain set of facts okay. and the validity of those facts can be ascertained only by a separate regulator or a separate court, then should okay. the antitrust regulator wait its turn? That's okay. the simple point. And Bombay High Court in a telecom related case has said so. What Bombay High Court said is that uh, this is the case involving Reliance, Geo, Vodafone, right. Idea and Airtel uh, where Reliance had complained to the CCI that uh, these incumbent operators were 
colluding by not offering sufficient points of interconnection to calls originating on the Reliance network. Right. It was an allegation of collusion. collusion. Right. But this allegation of collusion started from or originated from the inability of the incumbent telecom operators to technically provide sufficient points of interconnection. Now the authority which has the jurisdiction, to, which has the technical expertise to decide whether these incumbents were indeed technically not able to provide those points of interconnection or were they colluding with each other right. or sorry not were they colluding with each other but were they not doing so for some other reason other than technical lack of capacity right. now the first question was to be decided by the trai it had the exclusive right. domain and the bombay high court rightly says that yes you have the exclusive domain and in a part of the order which is not read by most people, it also says that once you have completed your fact-finding mission, the CCI may very well look at it. Right. So let one regulator decide the facts. And if those facts indicate that they could be the basis for an anti-competitive practice, then let CCI step in. Right. Now, this question has been not framed appropriately before the the Delhi High Court and my hope is that uh, we will be able to uh, uh, settle this question in in a manner that uh, the repeated occasion for these conflicts on jurisdictional issues don't arise I tell you where they arise from. Just like let's okay. pause for two minutes for the benefit of, of the audience here. You see, we have adopted a lot of things from US and Europe uh, in terms of uh, antitrust principles and also the hierarchy of the courts. Uh, okay. But this issue of IP and antitrust uh, first flared up in the US uh, okay. economic setup. Uh, and the judicial setup. In the United States, the antitrust regulators, both the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, uh, they bring charges before the regular courts in the United States. They don't themselves also decide on whether there is an anti-competitive practice or not. So in the US, when in the initial days when the IP and antitrust debate arose, uh, it arose from an, a pure play IP infringement suit. Okay. So when, when a patent holder goes to a court and says that person A is infringing on the patent, the first rebuttal response is that you don't have that patent. Okay. So your patent itself is invalid. And the second response is that you, by filing this infringement suit, are abusing your position of dominance because this suit is a frivolous suit. It is a false and vexatious litigation that you are mounting on me to increase my cost of doing business. So the origination is an IP infringement suit. The counter to that, the counter blast is that you don't have a valid IP and second, this suit itself is false and vexatious. Right. Now, all of these issues are being decided by one court. So how does the court frame the question of law? The court says that this is an IP dispute, which has an antitrust element and that antitrust element has an IP element once again. So in, in the US, some commentators have, have classified this as Turk, Duck, Hen. It's a, a turkey with a duck inside it with a hen inside the duck. So this question needs to be framed appropriately before the Indian writ courts. Uh, and if the question of a validity of an intellectual property right cannot be determined by the CCI. It is not the regulator. In India, validity of intellectual property rights will be determined by civil courts. Right. So, the, 
the CCI's jurisdiction should never be ousted, ousted but right. it must wait its turn. Right. I think this is uh, this is the collaboration and consultation based approach that we're talking about of the Bombay High Court in the Airtel case. And you you were quite right in saying that a lot of people ignore that approach and just say that okay, this is what the court actually holds, but Actually, the court has also made a very important point about the collaboration and CCI waiting its turn. So that, that's let me give you very... another example. And let me give you right. another, another example where the CCI has taken a step back. Okay. In the context of National Stock Exchange, there was a, uh, an allegation involving some uh, illegal practices, which now has infamously come to be known as the co-location case, right. uh, where certain brokers were. Uh, given terminals on the NSC infrastructure and apparently they were given preferential access to the NSC systems. Right. Uh, so allegation before the antitrust regulator was that this preferential access uh, is uh, leading to denial of market access for people who don't have this access. A fair antitrust allegation. Right. But the underlying fact of whether parties were located on the same premises, whether they were given a preferential access, all of this is regulated by the SEBI. And right. SEBI had to act as a fact-finding regulator. So when the CCI sat with this question, this allegation, it very rightly sent the matter back and said that this is SEBI's jurisdiction. Right. Now let's assume that SEBI comes out with its finding and says that yes, this was co-location, which was improper. There was preferential access given. Could that preferential access have led to denial of market access? Possibly. And therefore, should the CCI take the SEBI's determined fact as the starting point and start an investigation? It could. And there's nothing okay. wrong in that. Wait your turn is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's a fairly relevant and interesting point, sir. Uh, just moving to the last set of questions, or the last question I should say I have is relating to another very popular topic uh, these days, which is the latest round of investments in the geo platform by Facebook and uh, you know, the absolute tune of these investments, uh, like one round was approximately 43.43,500 crores for a 9.99% stake in the geo platforms. So like, uh, do you think that the merger thresholds in India should, you know, be reformed in some manner so that they can, you know, adopt a network-based approach or an effects-based approach rather than their existing or the present status quo. See, a couple of things. A lot of, at least Facebook's investment in Geo was notified to the CCI. Right. And approved by the CCI. Right. The other private equity investors which acquired less than 1% stake uh, they probably need not have notified and I think they have not notified their acquisitions because they benefited from a particular exemption. Those right. investments were made in the ordinary course of business or for investment purposes right. alone and they need not be notified to the commission. Uh, so let's leave this geo issue aside. Right. And if I were to rephrase your question, then is there the question is that is there a need uh, right. to look at the merger control related jurisdictional thresholds which are linked to the right. asset and turnover of the parties to the transaction right. especially in the context of tech based industries right uh, this is again a question which is not unique to india it is being right. raised and debated elsewhere right uh, my personal view is that there is no place for such a debate in india as yet we are okay. debating on an issue which will take us in the wrong direction. Now, why is that? You see, the, the 1990s was the best decade in India to move people away from uh, poverty to lower middle class and lower middle class to upper middle class. Why? Because it was the IT revolution decade. Right. And in the last 10 years, we have entered the phase of that uh, gig economy decade where multiple new startups are coming up right. and these are, it is these startups where the concern on 
the merger thresholds being too high comes into picture and that uh, 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 and that the CCI probably thinks that it is uh, losing out on the opportunity to examine certain deals. But we need to understand the startup economy first before we answer this question and, and understand that in the context of India. What have these startups done? They have created millions of jobs. Look at Zomato. It's one of the, uh, between Zomato, Swiggy and Uber and Ola, uh, right. we have created opportunities for uh, thousands and thousands of people to be meaningfully engaged. Right. Uh, I'm not saying that the engagement, that's the only type of job that as a country we should rest with. But that's a good starting point. Uh, for this system, there's no doubt in my mind that we need to create hundreds of Swiggies and Zomatos and all other Ubers in this country. And to do that, what do we need? We need capital. We don't have capital in this country. So we need foreign capital. We need money. Money goes where there is scope to make more money. Right. And therefore, your initial angel funding and VC funding is very important. Right. Now, angel investors and venture capital investors, they invest with this idea that they will make uh, multiples of their initial investment on certain investments within a defined period of time. And therefore, they walk into a company with the idea of exiting at some point in time. And that exit is critical. So if a venture capital investor does not know when and how it will exit, it will be very reluctant to touch that company. Right. Now, if we empower the commission to look at a transaction where an angel investor stepped in in the early days of the life cycle of the startup. Then a VC stepped in three or four years later and the VC wants to exit seven years later post its investment. Uh, in today's time, it could exit. Why? Because uh, the nature of these companies is such that their turnover will be less than the relevant thresholds. Uh, and therefore, when a venture capital wants to sell out to a strategic buyer, it can, right. at the snap of its finger, sell out and exit. It's very easy to exit. But right. tomorrow, if the regulator has to step in, that exit can get delayed by 30 days. It can get delayed theoretically by 210 days. That's what the Indian right. law allows. Now, a 210 day delay is almost a, a little more than, it's, it's a seven month delay. Right. Uh, so basically, your capital is packed somewhere for seven more months right. and you are constrained in that exit strategy. That's not good. Why? Because go back. We don't have capital. We need capital. There's no doubt. Capital will come where there is potential for more money to be made in as quick time as possible and in as painlessly as possible. We are competing for the capital as a country with other countries. So we are competing with Vietnam. We are competing with Singapore. We are competing with many other countries. And right. therefore, if we create another roadblock, that, that right. venture capital fund sitting out of Silicon Valley might as well go to Vietnam, which they have right. done by the way. Right. So we need to look at this debate in the context, in a very selfish context, in the context right. of India. And if we look at it in the context of India, then I think uh, that fear that something will slip away from your hands will go away. Because that fear right. will be far outweighed by this larger gain. And Right. This is the only thing that will take India out of the morass that we are in. Right. Create more and more entrepreneurs. That will happen right. if we embrace foreign capital, if we give them the ability to exit as soon as possible, as swiftly right. and as painlessly as possible. And therefore, there's no scope for one more round of approval. That's not needed at all. I think this is, again, a very, very novel point of looking at uh, the combination clearance from an ease of doing business, I should say, context. But and that ease of doing, biz doing business outweighing the potential fears and sometimes misplaced fears of these combinations. And I think that was, again, a fairly novel point. Uh, well, with that, sir, thank you so much for joining in this conversation. Thank you, uh, no, it I'm was not. personally okay. enlightening. And I'm, I'm sure that our viewers will have as much to gain from this conversation, uh, the clarity with which you have dealt with these issues and the novel perspectives 
wish only go a long way. So thank you.